National uh, Medicines and Vaccines Regulator. A uh, number of things today. Uh, first, uh, the TGA has approved uh, the use of Pfizer as a COVID-19 booster for uh, Australians 18 plus. Uh, this is an important step and uh, it will mean uh, that Australia will be one of the most highly vaccinated societies in the world, one of the most recently vaccinated communities in the world, and one of the first to receive a whole of population booster program. Uh, in particular, and John will go in, in more detail to both the uh, decision and the processes, the TDA has approved Pfizer as an 18 plus booster. Um, and very importantly, and Professor Murphy, Professor Kelly, Professor Skerritt, uh, Atagi and others have been at pains to point out that this is about additional protection and that you remain fully vaccinated with two vaccines. Uh, the next step is that ATAGI, uh, the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation, uh, will provide final advice. They have been working on an interim basis with the, uh, the TGA. Uh, but subject to uh, that ATAGI final advice, uh, we intend to commence the general population booster program no later than the 8th of November. And uh, we have the supplies. Uh, we have the distribution mechanisms. Uh, we'll just work with the, uh, the states, the GPs, the pharmacies, the Commonwealth vaccination clinics and the Indigenous uh, vaccination clinics uh, to ensure everything's in place. Uh, and uh, we will commence uh, aged care and disability as a priority. This morning I had a very uh, constructive conversation with my Victorian counterpart, the uh, State Health Minister Martin Foley, and uh, Victoria, which of course has the uh, most significant current outbreak will uh, be looking to uh, commence their aged care and disability support uh, booster for those that are six months plus um, since they've had their second dose uh, in the imminent future. So um, that's very constructive and I thank them for, for that. Uh, and then finally, as I say, it's a universal booster and so it's uh, available for people who've had uh, Pfizer, AstraZeneca or Moderna, uh, although it's uh, nobody who has had a second dose of Moderna would get qualifiers, that's been more recent. But as people come to the six month plus time frame since their second mm. dose, uh, Pfizer will be available. John will uh, set out other regulatory applications which are pending from different companies. Uh, then in terms of international travel, uh, the Prime Minister has uh, indicated that uh, I've signed off on the biosecurity declaration order, which means one very simple thing. From the 1st of November, double vaxxed Australians will be able to leave the country and return to the country. And uh, so fully vaccinated Australians will not require an exemption to depart Australia from the uh, 1st of November. This is the first stage of our international reopening. Um, subsequently, we'll have a second stage focusing on students and uh, uh, critical workers. Um, we're also looking, as the Prime Minister ind has indicated, at uh, early arrangements with Singapore. And uh, then we'll look at uh, general travel uh, for tourism and other purposes for people entering the, uh, entering the country. Uh, also pleased to be able to report that uh, overnight we've received our first shipment of Ronaprev, uh, the combination monoclonal antibody th uh, therapy uh, that will now be made available uh, via the hospital process uh, for treating patients uh, with COVID-19. And then finally, just in terms of the, um, the rollout, um, another um, 227,000 vaccinations yesterday. We're now at over 34.8 million doses. Very significantly, we've passed the 18 million first dose mark, and we're at 87.4 million, 87.4% uh, uh, of Australian 16 plus uh, who've had a first dose. And uh, in terms of second doses, uh, we're at 15.4 million uh, 16 plus and 74.8%. But just over 1 million Australians to come forward to have their second dose to achieve the 80% double vaccinated rate. So just over 1 million Australians uh, to come forward to achieve the 80% double vaccinated rate uh, for the national average. And then finally, 
the purpose of all of this is to protect the most vulnerable. Uh, our 70 plus population now has a 98.7% first vaccination rate uh, and uh, uh, over 88% second vaccination rate. Uh, I do particularly want to thank John and all of the officials at the TGA and all of the officials um, and advisors at ATAGI for their work. TGA, it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, uh, John, just as a personal example, uh, confessed to me this morning he hadn't been home to Victoria for six months. He's just been working through. And that's the sort of support we've had uh, from uh, our scientists and officials at the TGA, uh, in the health department, in, in the other departments, and, and also the personal staff. You know, our personal staff work phenomenal hours. They're working you know, until midnight last night. They're working from the earliest hours in the morning. And so, you know, it's been a great challenge as a nation, but we are immensely well served by those who are in public service. John? Thanks, Minister. Uh, none of us uh, joined the health department or the TGA expecting to have a pandemic. Uh, it's, also, it's been the most challenging period, but as far as importance to the health and welfare and the future of the Australian community, probably the most important work the team has ever done. And uh, uh, as the minister said, this is the result of a team effort and uh, no, longer, no sooner does one marathon finish than another one starts. So as the minister indicated, the t TGA uh, last night, uh, and again, I use the word last night pointedly because uh, it is that nature of business, but after business hours. So last night, the TGA uh, made the final approval of a booster dose of a vaccine. It's for ages over 18 years. And uh, it's over 18 years because that's the data from the clinical trials. And I'll come back and talk about the data on which the decision was made, because that's an important part of the confidence that Australians need to have and should have in the uh, thoroughness of a regulatory process. And that means that anyone over 18 can receive a booster dose. And again, the anyone will be subject to ATAGI advice, but uh, our we are not second guessing the ATAGI advice. It, uh, the TGA advice just says over 18, uh, at least six months. And again, it doesn't mean that everyone needs to front up on six months in one day. It's again, at least six months uh, after the completion of the COVID vaccine primary series. It's the same dose administered in the same way as the first two shots of Pfizer. And importantly, uh, it was approved to go as a third dose after completion of the primary course of any of the other ones. And as the Minister said, no one will be six months after two Modernas yet, but there will be people uh, who will uh, uh, be at uh, six months after AstraZeneca's in the coming months, and there are some people who are at six months after two Pfizer's already. The other thing that TJ did, uh, you're aware that early this month, the ATAGI recommended for people who were severely immunocompromised that they could get, it's not called a booster shot, but a third shot because their immune systems don't respond as well to the first two vaccines, uh, but they could get a third shot 28 days after. In reviewing the clinical evidence, that is now officially part of the uh, uh, product information or the official approval of a vaccine. And there's a range of immunocompromised conditions, uh, and that includes down to 12 years old. So in that case, the children down to 12, if, if they're severely immunocompromised kiddies, a kid with uh, cancer, a kid who's having chemotherapy, a kid who may have had an organ transplant, or an adult for that matter, uh, various stem cell transplants, or on certain medicines that suppress the immune system. So there's a, a defined list of conditions on the health department's website. So down to 12, uh, that's for the uh, severely immunocompromised kids, and over 18 for uh, the wider population. Now, as the minister said, it's important to reinforce that two doses of each of the approved vaccines do provide excellent protection against serious illness, hospitalisation and death. And that's not just us saying it, there's now more than a dozen global studies that reinforce that. But we do know that uh, boosters may give additional protection against mild COVID and they may have an impact on reducing transmission. And we do know that in the elderly and people who have various shades of immunocompromise, that an additional dose is particularly valuable. And it may well provide reassurance for frontline health workers. Now, uh, just in terms of numbers, we're expecting that uh, 
By January 1, there'll be about 1.6 million people who'll be six months or more after their courses. And uh, again, because of the efforts of a government, including the additional procurement from overseas, there is more than enough vaccine in the system to cover that, uh, should the advice come from ATAGI to do that. I just want, before I finish, just want to touch on data. So we had the regulatory submission, which uh, was in people between 18 and 85 years old, showing that uh, the vaccine's well tolerated. Some people had a little bit of swelling of the lymph nodes, as you often get with various viral infections, but they went away for a few after a few days. There was a big study done in Israel of over a million people that showed, uh, especially those over 60, their chance of becoming seriously ill and getting infected was very significantly reduced with a third dose booster, and that's in over 60s. And there were some recent results, uh, not yet in a, in a medical journal, but uh, on a thousand subjects showing that uh, a third dose uh, booster actually increased vaccine efficacy to 96%. Now, I just want to finish by foreshadowing a few things. Uh, as I said, my, the staff have gone into the showers after a marathon, and I'm asking them to go back out onto the uh, running track first thing in the morning. And we, coincidentally, yesterday we received not the full application, but most of it, but we still have more to get from the Pfizer application for five to 11 year olds. And we will look at that carefully. Some of you may be aware that overnight, in fact, I think 7 a.m. this morning, the announcement was made. I did have a staff member who was on that committee meeting all night. I hope he's in bed now. But uh, uh, the FDA announced that their advisory committee had endorsed uh, uh, with no, uh, no, no votes, uh, the application from Pfizer, five to 11 year old, that works through their system. It involves FDA making a decision and then the US Centers for Disease Control and Protection making a decision. Uh, we also uh, are working with other companies such as Moderna on, on potential boosters. Moderna have also indicated that they have assembled data on younger age groups as well. And of course, uh, Novavax have announced publicly that in the next fortnight they expect to complete the submission of data to major regulators, and that may well include Australia. And finally, those of you uh, will also have seen that uh, we believe the uh, November 1 launch date for the rapid antigen tests will be maintained. Uh, major supermarket chains and convenience stores have announced that they will have stock available from that date. We've approved nine rapid antigen tests to date and we have uh, another few in advanced stages of review, working with the companies just to finalise things such as the instructions for using them. Thanks very much. Thank I'll start uh, with Rachel and then work across. Thanks, Minister. Um, <coughs> firstly, you said that the general population rollout for boosters is likely to start on November 8, but aged care and disability sector will be prioritised. Given the target's meeting today, could that roll out for those aged care residents start as soon as tomorrow? And secondly, how will the booster shot be recorded on our vaccination certificate? Sure. Or be uh, uh, I won't preempt Ataki's advice, but they have worked very closely with uh, the TGA, and so I'm quietly hopeful, but uh, subject to, to their advice, November the 8th for the general population. Uh, for aged care and, and disability, we already have uh, sufficient support from Ataki on the basis of their preliminary advice for that to commence. So that uh, program, uh, Victoria, is looking to commence it immediately. Those that wish to provide self-vaccination, um, so there are a number of uh, facilities and uh, providers that do that. One example I've given previously is, is TLC. Uh, they are probably one of the leading uh, providers with regards to self-vaccination. They're all preparing to do it. They do have to get consent from their residents uh, or their residents' carers. Um, and so that process will determine it. But subject to the consent process in aged care and uh, those disability residents who had uh, early vaccinations, uh, they're free to proceed uh, and we're facilitating the arrangement of, uh, of those. Uh, second question, apologies. Um, it was on how, how will our booster <coughs> dose be reported? Will it be part of our vaccination certificate and will that be required for travel? Uh, no, it's not a required element. You are fully vaccinated. Uh, at this uh, at this point in time, and then it will be uh, will be added to the immunisation register, um, as is the uh, the ordinary course of events um, at the moment. You know, your flu vaccine, um, your uh, children's national immunisation program uh, vaccinations, and your your doses as they arrive, um, and so that will be record uh, be recorded on your uh, immunisation register. Claire, um, do we have any 
idea of where, in what settings the rapid antigen tests will be allowed? Have states indicated will they be able to replace if you go into quarantine or be used to enter their borders? And, and also, Minister, just on the booster, the original vaccine also wasn't initially compulsory, but over time, certain professions were added to that list. Could that be the case for the booster? So uh, I'll speak very briefly on boosters and then turn to uh, to John on rapid antigen tests. So um, at this stage, there's no uh, plan or intention. Um, and again, the Commonwealth has not been uh, mandating other than in the aged care uh, staff setting, where at the moment we're at 99.8%. And I want to thank all of those staff for participating in that. Uh, and again, we'll always follow the medical advice. So um, I'll leave that to individual states or territories. but. The, the clear advice and the preliminary ATAGI advice, um, the advice from uh, CITAG, Professor Brendan Murphy's uh, team, um, as well as the TGOs, you are fully vaccinated, but the booster is, as John has set out, just that. It adds to, adds to protection. John? On the rapid antigen tests, uh, firstly, there's no constraints uh, as to uh, where they can be sold, including online, convenience stores, petrol stations, anywhere. There are a few few rules around the advertising of those tests. Uh, they can be advertised, but for example, they can't say our test is better than their test. So there are controls, and that's usual for medicines and medical devices at comparative advertising and claiming. Also, for example, they can't claim to be diagnostic, you know, because it is a screening test, uh, and people who test positive should go and have a PCR gold standard test. As far as the states and territories are concerned, they're working out their own policies for rollout of those tests. For example, New South Wales Education has said they're going to mainly target them for outbreak control rather than testing every school child. But uh, now the tests are here and some of the states and territories have indicated they'll procure as well as the market. Uh, they will make uh, decisions on how they roll out those tests. Minister, um, on the logistics of this, will there be reminder messages sent out to people that your six months has now passed or is it incumbent on you to do it? And Professor Skerritt, can I ask you, is this three shots and you're done, or are we going to be getting every six months you'll have to get another booster shot? Do you, do you want to start with that one, John? Yeah, unfortunately I wasn't issued with a crystal ball when I got this job. <laughs> now, what with other vaccines, uh, and again, we don't have that experience with messenger RNA vaccines, so I don't want to necessarily make a comparison. There are some vaccines whereby three shots gives you almost lifelong protection. So, as I said when the vaccine was initially approved, when I, when I stood up with the minister and the prime minister, Seems like a lifetime ago, but it was only uh, in, in, in January, February. Uh, we didn't know about the duration of protection. And so no one knows about the duration of protection post this uh, booster. The really good news is that uh, a few months ago, we were worried that we'd have to have quite different vaccines because of the emergence of variants. And even with the severity of Delta and how predominant Delta has been globally, we haven't needed to change the booster. So um, unfortunately, the answer is we'll have to wait and see. Uh, so uh, right now what happens is that obviously the, it, it continues to, to roll out in exactly the same way. Uh, we have the, uh, the booster program is, uh, is ready to go. Uh, we just now will work with the states and territories uh, and, uh, and with the GPs. And so uh, it's, uh, it's just continuing on. Tom? Thanks, Minister. Professor Scarrett, what do you think the timeline will be uh, using the FDA as an indication for kids' approval in Australia? Is it, is it weeks away? Well, we've got an incomplete application. It's not in the full final format, so it's not a legally uh, binding application yet. So, and this is quite normal. Uh, the drug companies do test the waters with FDA before they even go to Europe, never mind Australia. So we're expecting to get a full application in the coming week or two. Uh, as I've said, our team's got out of a shower and have started to look at this, having finished the boosters literally at six o'clock last night. Uh, it will depend on on quality of data. Uh, they're only just starting to, to look at it because they only got the data. So uh, it will take a few weeks, but I would hope uh, that we would get there by the end of November. But it really does depend when we get the full application from Pfizer, a complete version, and if there's any issues. We also have to remember that FDA has not approved it yet. Uh, their committee recommendation is made public. They have to look at it, and then the Centres for Disease Control have to look at it in early November. Professor. Oh, um, oh, Minister, um, so we're heading towards 80% of the population being double-dosed. 
Um, is there a target as to how many of that you expect to get a booster shot? Are there any estimates set? And also given that the booster shots will be rolled out first um, to aged care um, disability, um, given that there were issues getting them into those settings um, for the first vaccine rollout, what sort of lessons have been learned from that to make sure that there isn't any sort of delays in terms of um, supply or getting numbers up when the boosters are Sure, shot? sure. Um, so the, the first thing is we don't want to put any limits on the number of people to have first doses, second doses or booster shots. And uh, we want to encourage every Australian that is eligible to continue to come forwards to complete their primary course and when they are due um, six months plus to come forward for their for their boosters so we don't want to put any uh, any limits on that we want to encourage every eligible Australian to do so uh, then uh, I think that's the that's the, the critical thing there in terms of uh, age care uh, we went through, we were able to uh, make sure everybody was vaccinated. The principal challenge was, uh, was supply. Uh, we have uh, full supply and we're already in preparation and planning uh, to roll out. This time uh, there's only uh, one shot that's required and there is a, a sort of a, a, an unconstrained supply. So that's uh, important and it follows the six months plus and we're in a very strong situation. Thank you. Um, Professor Scarrett, just on um, mixing and matching, the messaging until now has been don't mix and match. Now you're saying if you've had AZ you can get Pfizer. So mm. can you just run through why that's okay? And just secondly as well, um, with mm. pregnancy, um, Pfizer has been you know, approved and it's safe for women that are pregnant. Is it still the same with the booster shot? And to you, Minister Hunt, um, you've said you expect population-wide, so age 18 and up. In the US and UK, they've got specific groups. It's not population-wide. So why is it going to be different here? And also one more, sorry, from Melbourne, um, on the tennis. I know everyone wants to know about the tennis stars. Um, are you comfortable with unvaccinated tennis stars coming to Australia if they complete two weeks of quarantine? John, go first, and then you got a lot of value for your money in that. <laughs> So, so you asked about pregnancy and there's been a number of studies now published on pregnancy and pregnancy outcomes. Uh, I think it's about five or so now. Uh, and it's usual, but as every week goes by, there's probably 10 papers published in top shelf medical journals on these vaccines. And so our body of knowledge increases. So those five studies have shown that there's no impact on pregnancies uh, with these vaccines and they're recommended uh, for, for use and so there's no evidence to suggest that uh, a booster should be any different there so uh, it, it won't be to use a medical word contraindicated in pregnancy. On mix and match we were cautious uh, again back in I think I was asked at estimates in June and we were cautious because there'd only been one or two studies and very little clinical observation. Again, the, there's probably now dozens of studies to show that actually mixing and matching, so for example, two AstraZeneca's and then a Pfizer, or even one AstraZeneca and a Pfizer, actually gives a really good immune response. And so regulators worldwide in almost November, the end of October, are a lot more confident about uh, the value of mix and match than we were in May or June. So in terms of the whole of population, um, that's the approval. And uh, we've followed the the advice on the approval, obviously we'll await the, the final advice from ATAGI, but they've been working very closely uh, with, uh, with the TGA throughout and uh, the, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of engagement there. So subject to the ATAGI advice, we're ready to proceed. Uh, Israel has commenced that. Uh, I, I know other countries are considering and moving towards. I'm not aware of any other country that has commenced, but I remain to be corrected on that. But certainly we know that Israel uh, has commenced. What that would mean is that Australia would be one of the first countries in the world to commence a whole of population booster program. So we would have one of the highest vaccination rates, one of the most recently vaccinated populations, and one of the uh, first booster programs, which means that we will be one of the most protected countries in the world. In terms of the tennis, pretty simple position. And that is, uh, you can come in if you're double vaccinated. Uh, if a, uh, a state uh, is seeking an exemption for somebody to come in for a, 
uh, a workplace program or a similar event and they are unvaccinated, they can come in uh, if that state uh, seeks it and uh, they are subject, however, to the two weeks quarantine and that's without fear or favour. And so then it's entirely a matter for the state or the state working with Tennis Australia. And if there's a no jab, no play uh, policy in, in Victoria, that that's a matter for them to resolve. So uh, you have to do quarantine if you haven't been vaccinated. If the state wishes to seek the exemption for the players, not any one particular player, uh, then uh, that would be granted at the Commonwealth level on a major events basis but it would require the full vaccination. Jade, and then Sarah. Um, will you make any changes to allow pharmacies to administer their Pfizer as a booster oh. shot? Um, and also a question for Professor Skerritt. Um, will the process for assessing Pfizer for children be any different to the process for assessing Pfizer in adults? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so the answer is yes. Uh, we will be uh, making Pfizer available to uh, pharmacies and we will be making Moderna available to those GPs that, uh, uh, that wish to uh, put it in place, particularly in some rural areas uh, or more remote areas. There's uh, an interest uh, in, uh, in Moderna for GPs, but uh, because of, precisely because at this stage there hasn't been an application and uh, an approval for Moderna as a booster uh, for the pharmacies that are operating the programs, we want to make sure that that's available. John, on. on the process for Pfizer, as soon as any medicine or vaccine is proposed for use or applied for use in children, you obviously need to dig even deeper, and I'm saying even because we look at safety very thoroughly for every age group, but we dig in even deeper for children. And so the, the trial data for the children will be on more kids than, say, on the booster. We, the safety monitoring has been for a longer period of time. Uh, we're not seeing any red flags there, I should say, but it's very early days yet. Uh, but yes, we, and, and the other thing is, is that the application, again, this is public knowledge, for the children is for a third of a dose, uh, because they believe once you're under 11, a third of a dose uh, is just as good as, so it's 10 micrograms rather than 30 micrograms. So, but, so in that way, the process for the kids is different, uh, but the nature of the data is the same. And so far it looks okay, but as I've said, we've only had it for a day. Yeah. Sarah? Um, just on kids now, five to 11, possibly being vaccinated, do you ever see a situation where it will be no jab, no play? We've got that for other vaccinations for children. Now they're gonna be able to get a COVID jab. How do you see that evolving? Sure, so uh, no, no plans uh, or expectations at, uh, at this point in time. And uh, I, I think that's likely to remain the case. Um, given that international travel is opening up, will there be a point in time in the future where people will need their booster to travel overseas and return from overseas? And a second, if I may, um, we're obviously moving on to boosters, but the UN has said that you know we should developed countries should prioritise um, helping vaccinate poor countries. Um, has there been any update on, on vaccinating our Pacific neighbours? Sure. Well, let, let me start with the uh, with the Pacific. Uh, we're committed to 60 million vaccines as well as half a million dollars of uh, half a billion dollars of funding um, on that front. Um, the AstraZeneca uh, is uh, was done with the capacity to vaccinate the whole of the Australian population uh, twice, um, and we always knew that if we had spare of vaccines, um, we would be able to share them and. Uh, Fiji has been, as an example, very significantly vaccinated uh, with uh, Australian-made uh, CSL-produced AstraZeneca vaccine. And so we'll continue to supply. We're going to complete, uh, make sure we complete that contract, even though uh, we've been supplied with all we need for Australia to meet our first and second doses with AstraZeneca. Um, part of our duty to the region is to, uh, is to continue to provide that. And we're engaged um, literally every day through the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade with regional countries. I'd, I'd just add, Minister, it's not just the supply, although obviously the supply is central. We're also very actively involved technically in helping those countries work out how to administer the vaccines, how to store them, how to report safety issues, and also looking at a broader range of vaccines. And I actually have a team of people funded by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade that is providing technical support underpinning these tens of millions of doses that we're providing in the region. So just uh, in terms of international travel and boosters, um, the, again, 
uh, at this point in time. And uh, as we've said throughout the pandemic, we have to review everything as as it progresses and as the science evolves. But the advice we have is you remain fully vaccinated with the two vaccines and we'll continue to follow the international science, but that's uh, that's the requirement for international travel. Thanks, Minister. Just moving away from vaccines for a moment, if I can. Um, health groups, both national and international, are calling for more ambitious climate targets to protect Australians' health, um, saying they want to see health explicitly outlined in our climate commitments. Does Australia's emissions reduction plan do enough to address the health risks associated with climate change? And how much was health involved in developing that plan? Uh, so uh, the answer is, in my view, yes. Um, it is a, a very important uh, consideration and it was well considered. Um, I was deeply engaged, the Department of Health was engaged. Um, I was involved not just um, as a cabinet minister, but through the preliminary discussions. Obviously, I have the current hat, but I had a previous hat having helped develop and lead and uh, Australia's position for the previous uh, for the pre uh, for the previous international pledging conference, the Paris conference. Um, so health was was uh, deeply engaged, and I'm very thankful to the the Prime Minister and to uh, Angus Taylor, the Minister for uh, uh, Emissions Reduction and uh, and Energy, uh, for that as well as industry. Um, uh, and my uh, Look, let me give you my personal view on this. This is a very significant moment in Australia, and it's a significant moment for a number of reasons. One is it builds on what we did in Paris. In Paris, and some of you will have been in, in this room in 2015 when we announced it with uh, then Prime Minister Tony Abbott and, and with Julie Bishop, and to go from minus five to minus 26 to minus 28 was a major step and uh, many doubted that we'd be able to achieve 2020's Kyoto 2 target, let alone the Paris target. We've roared past uh, 2020, and we did that without an electricity uh, tax. Uh, we're going to clearly uh, meet and significantly beat our 2030 targets with the revised projections. And now we've committed to, to net zero, and we were cautious in doing that because we didn't want to make a pledge which would either uh, damage jobs uh, or drive up electricity prices. But once we were able to uh, see that pathway, Angus followed that same careful process of having worked it through. And so um, I'm really proud of the next evolution. Uh, I think it's good for health. Um, I think it protects jobs. Uh, and I think it's uh, a great thing uh, that Australia is playing this leading role. The other thing I'd mention when you think of it as India over 80% increase since 2005, China over 70% increase, South Korea over 30% uh, increase, Canada is a minus 1% decrease since 2005, New Zealand minus 4, um, you have Japan and the US about 7 and 13 I believe, I'm, I stand to be corrected, and then Australia and the EU are at minus 20.8 and minus 21. So we're almost identical in our reductions to the EU. Um, we are right at the global forefront of reducing emissions. Josh, to finish. Uh, Sorry, that was. I'd been waiting my chance to <laughs> say on that. Thanks, Josh. Um, just, just two quick ones. Um, one on the rapid tests. Um, will they only be available for purchase, or will they be available for free at some point, like in the UK? And if not, why not? Um, and I guess one of the boosters as well, as, as you both said. Um, after two doses, you're fully vaccinated. I think some people might ask, what, what, what's the point then of getting a third one? Is it just a peace of mind sort of thing? Or, or will there be, I guess, at some point, your full vaccination status kind of expires or runs out or something? Sure. Uh, do, do you want to go to the point of, uh, of boosters? I'll do the booster one, if you yep. want to do a rapid test one, Minister. So uh, while we've emphasised that two vaccinations is considered fully vaccinated, uh, whether it be for entry to domestic venues or for international travel, there's no doubt that uh, there is some waning, albeit slower than perhaps some of the pundits have called it. There is some waning of the uh, immune response, especially in people over 60, especially with those who have immunocompromises. And so uh, in those populations in particular, but again, if someone in the general population may six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 months later, uh, they're getting a booster to just give them absolute coverage, not only against uh, serious illness, but also against uh, mild illness and transmission. And those two things 
one-off life-threatening are very important for the economy and for returning to uh, pre-COVID life. So look, the, the trick to the booster is in the name. It's a booster. It's an Olympic year. Sidious Altius Fortius. Faster, higher, stronger. Uh, it's additional protection over and above. Sorry, I've really taken to freelancing now. Uh, but, uh, you know, the booster is, is, is all about the name. It's perfectly titled. Uh, extra protection. In terms of uh, rapid antigen testing, um, so the, the critical thing here is that uh, currently we have uh, trials uh, which are underway where we've been providing support in, in aged care um, and we have uh, supplies which have been ama made available uh, to certain critical user groups uh, through the, uh, um, through the uh, national medical stockpile. But we're making it generally available and uh, we'll uh, let that market develop and for those that have got the critical needs we've been able to provide them. Uh, it's not a replacement. Uh, for the PCR, as John um, has been at pains to rightly point out. Um, it's an additional support and a, an additional screening tool rather than a, a pure diagnostic tool. So they, they do serve those two different purposes. Uh, I'll just finish uh, with saying another important milestone today uh, in terms of Australia's vaccination program and uh, the boosters uh, will mean that we will be one of the most highly vaccinated societies one of the most recently vaccinated societies uh, and as a consequence, uh, one of the best protected societies in the world. Take care, everybody. Thank you.